let's start by singing that chorus together. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him.
together this morning. And I want you to get all on the page. I need to get everything recorded. He's been dropping the book. He's been waiting on the introduction. Thank you, Elmer. <laughs> Turn number 23. Song that when I was picking this out, I thought about the fall season, how pretty the trees were, and how nice the weather we've been having. Think of what God has provided for us in the scenery. But more than that, what He's given for us in our hearts. For the beauty of the earth, number 23. For friends, for joy. Let's thank and praise Him as we sing. 23.
But our lives affect each other an awful lot. It's hard to meet people and not affect them in some way or another, good or bad. Uh, I can look out, most of you have affected and influenced me somewhere or another. So you're the ones to blame. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I was sitting there thinking of my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And, uh, it's a funny verse, I think. It might not be funny to some of you. But it's, it's in the Old Testament, and I can't quote it. But it goes something like this, uh, the storyline. God told uh, some of the uh, children of Israel uh, to take up rocks, uh, big rocks, and put them on their shoulders. And said to carry them over to the to the other land so that your children and your grandchildren remember that uh, God was faithful to you. Now the verse ends there and it goes on, but <clears throat> what I used to picture there was that uh, after many years, these old uh, people with beards and white hair was carrying around rocks on their shoulders. <laughs> and the children would come up and ask, what's that rock on your shoulders? <laughs> grandchildren. I thought that was funny, but I, I failed to read on and it says that they, they put the rocks down and built an altar. That's why the children remember what the Lord is faithful for. We leave a lot of things uh, in this life after we, uh, after we go. Uh, most of them are sold and uh, are given away. We leave memories to and thoughts. I was thinking of uh, ten years ago in this church and, and uh, some people have left. Some people have, have gone to heaven. Some people have left the faith, too. And it's sad to say. We had the job of passing on to our children, uh, grandchildren, uh, the faith. Sometimes we've let that down, I'm afraid. Uh, selling Christ to our children and, and grandchildren, it's not an easy thing to do. They're not going to do it automatically. And it has to be shown through our lives. They need the encouragement of us now and especially after you're passed on to continue with what they're doing. It's our most important job. The song talks about a commitment to the future of how we should do And 
our children sit through all that's left behind. May the truths that they discover and memories uncover become the light that leads them down the road of eternal life. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fires of our emotions light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lies we live inside them to obey.
ashamed about. <coughs> I'm kind of proud of him. Once in a while, I even brag on him. I tell folks that I taught him how to sing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't believe me, but uh, sounds good anyway. Oh my. I better get into the message. Hey. After Brother Dave uh, asked me to share, I began to pray about what to share. And I do feel that the Lord has given me a message for you folks today. And uh, a message that I believe that I suppose it would be good for the Church of God wherever that we meet, but uh, especially for this day, for this congregation. And, uh, and I hope you listen and let God's Spirit just touch your heart this morning. Not for necessarily because of the spokesman, but what is spoken. That's what's important. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Revelations. We're going to read just a few verses out of the first chapter. And then we're going to look and think about what the messages were that the Lord instructed John to share. And uh, so that's going to cover the second and third chapters, and we'll get around to the banana cream pie after a while. <laughs> okay. In the ninth verse of the first chapter of the book of Revelations, John speaking, he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden <coughs> candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the packs with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet likened to fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth, in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Brother David, we're called angels there. Now, isn't that wonderful? You didn't know preachers were angels, did you? Anyway, and uh, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. I'd like to speak this morning on the subject of the church that succeeds. The church that succeeds. Let me ask you a question. What is success? You think about that for a few moments. What is success? By what standards do we measure success? Well, I looked in the dictionary to see what success is. Once in a while I find a word, I think I know what it means, and 
Then when I think about it, I'm not really sure I do know what it means. And so I looked in the dictionary, and this is what I found. First of all, it said that success is favorable or desired outcome. Exalted or given honor to one of their sons or daughters that's just common or unknown. Have you? But you let somebody become rich and in love and fervor for the things of God and even for Christ himself. <laughs> well, he moved on to Smyrna. Now the Lord said that Smyrna was poverty stricken and earthly material. They didn't have much. They, they didn't have a, a nice building. They didn't have nice things. They were poverty stricken. But yet God said that they were faithful and that he had no rebuke whatsoever for them. They passed the test of the church. This all goes on file in the church. Church's office. At Pergamos, God said they had good works. And they kept the name of the Lord in the midst of a godless community. Now that sounds pretty good. That's very commendable. But God said that they tolerated false doctrine in their midst. Allowed folks in their midst to practice and teach false doctrine. And he said they better straighten that up. Better take care of that. Yeah. Tribulations and no word of condemnation from the Lord. Wonderful. At Laodicea, God said they were rich in material goods without a need of anything. But the Lord said they were lukewarm in their spirit. They were wretched and poor and blind and naked. Out of these seven churches, only two passed God's inspection without review. Only two of these seven churches that is spoken of in Revelation, the churches of Asia that John ministered to, only two out of the seven were successful in the eyes and in the judgment of God. Completely successful. I want us to think this morning for just a few minutes on what God's standard for success is not. What success is not. First of all, the success for the church is not in material wealth. It's not in bank accounts. How much money that we've accumulated over the years and put in bank accounts and just adding interest. It's not in our fine buildings, although we're thankful for fine buildings. And we're certainly grateful for what God has done for us here in this community by providing. But that's not success. That's not success. Success in the things of God is not in establishing religious impacts. We've seen some of them crumbling lately, haven't we? And my great has been the fall of him. You see. That's not success on how much is spent on television or radio programs. Although these can be greatly beneficial for the kingdom of God. Yet that's not in itself success. You need your pants changed. Success spiritually is not in good works. We are not saved through our good works or by our good works. Good works are a byproduct of Christianity, not Christianity in itself. God's standards for success is not found in religious formalism or ritual, however we label them. Success spiritually is not in the teaching of right doctrines alone. All those these are essential, yet we can take doctrine that is biblically correct and void of spiritual warmth and the blessings and the love of God, and it can be detrimental rather than upbuilding. It can kill rather than build. 
and give life unless that we have the Spirit of God. And so we come down to what the standards of a successful church are. And I want to share that with you. And I want to encourage you to continue to be this kind of church. I believe that you have been. We have seen it evidenced over and over again. We have witnessed the blessings of God on this congregation. As I've been thinking and planning and praying for this message, I began to try to put together in my own mind some of the greatest things that this church has. And you know what I came up with? I came up with two things. And I believe with all of my heart that one is dependent upon the first. I came up with the love that is evidenced in the hearts of the people. I've had people tell me when I was pastoring here that when they drove on the grounds, they felt a spirit of God's love that reached out to them. I thought that was one of the greatest compliments that was ever paid. But I believe that the love that is in the hearts of you people is dependent upon the faithfulness of the prayer around the altars. And that, I believe, is the greatest asset.
<laughs> if he doesn't, why well, I want to see what he looks like when he gets through eating that whole pie. <laughs> oh, oh, Elmer. <laughs> oh, okay. Smile. I know where all that good food's coming from, right out of this kitchen. Oh. All these good cooks in there. Uh huh. A lot of good cooks in here today. Needs to be. Go step outside. Yeah. So start taking this out here. Run, Aunt Lou. <laughs> Let me get your picture. Oh, really? <laughs> now then. Oh, my. Okay. There, You're on record. I should have gotten over there by Fern. <laughs> Fern? Turn oh, around. Let me I get your picture. I got a knife. <laughs> uh oh, I'm going to run. <laughs> okay. Which way are you going to go, Elmer? <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Okay. Hey.
But what I'm concerned about now is that we don't let up with the vision that we need for the work of God. If you want to become and continue to be a successful church for the glory of God, then you must have a vision of what the church needs to be doing. You need to set some plans and make some goals and work together in the Spirit of God to be able to accomplish things that you want to accomplish as a congregation. The Bible says when we do, we'll save ourselves and those that, that we love. And I believe that. Continue in all of these things. Continue to be the people of God, the separate people, a holy people, a visionary people, a people that is known because of the great love that you have in your hearts for one another and for the community that is not yet saved. God bless you all.
Gilligan?
Father, we're so thankful that you love us. We're thankful, Father, that you love us enough that you gave your most precious gift, your Son, Jesus Christ, who willingly went to a cross and died for our sins. Thank you, Lord, you loved us that much. We thank you for the opportunity we have this afternoon to come together to worship you and to praise you for all that you've done. Father, we pray that hearts might be touched today by the ministry of this quartet. May you use the music, Father, to speak to us today. And may everything be said and done to the glory and honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs>
also for Brother Dave and then Joyce, all the really think a lot of you folks. You meant a lot to my life and a lot to the life of the quartet. I appreciate you very much. I'd like to sing a song now for you. It's an older song, but one that, that still has a, a really good message, I think. It's called Shelter in the Arms of God. <laughs> Sometimes at doing everything, 
that we need to do or even everything we ought to do a lot of the time. But I know somebody who can do everything we need done for us. And that person is Jesus Christ. The song says, can he? Could he? Would he? <laughs> and then it says he sure did. <laughs> Behold the 
town. You know the angels didn't dance around. And when a man stepped on the moon, they didn't sing a victory too. There's only one thing that we're sure about that can make those angels jump and shout. It's when a sinner makes the Lord his choice. That's when the angels rejoice. Now heaven doesn't strike up the bank or any old occasion at hand. It's gotta be a special, it's gotta be a special thing. Hit the street, it didn't bring all heaven to its feet. And when the first computer was born, they didn't blow on Gabriel's horn. There's only one thing that we're sure about that can make those angels jump and shout. It's when a sinner makes the Lord his choice. That's when the angels rejoice. Now when the United States became a nation, there was no angelic celebration. But one lost sinner comes back home. They jump for joy around the throne. There's only one thing that we're sure about that can make those angels jump and shout. It's when a sinner makes the That's when the angels rejoice. That's when the angels rejoice. Yes, I know. That's when the angels rejoice.
Jesus paying for our sins as he died on the cross. But the angels, it's almost as though they were right there, you know, just waiting, just waiting one word for Jesus to come and take him out of all of that situation. I don't know exactly how they felt. The scripture doesn't tell us, but the song says the angels must have cried.
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Holy and excellent. 
Until I reach that place How little I have given up to you Boy, break down my will Make my desire your own Oh, I 